Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump tonight is saying is a persecution. And we begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history. A former president in court today facing criminal charges from the government he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment. Speaking in Bedminster, New Jersey tonight, Trump was defiant. The most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch a corrupt sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges of which he and numerous other presidents would be guilty right in the middle of a presidential election. Earlier today, Trump traveled to the Miami courthouse alone. Trump was seen waving out the window. The former president was fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Then for the first time, Trump came face to face with special counsel Jack Smith. Magistrate Judge Jonathan Goodman, who oversaw the hearing, ordered Trump not to discuss the cases with any witnesses outside of the court. There was a festive feeling and atmosphere there. Most of the hundreds who showed up were there to support Trump, while others were there in protest. So what comes next is this historic legal showdown plays out in the middle of the 2024 campaign season. Our team is standing by to break it all down tonight. And we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in Miami. Donald Trump this morning walking to his motorcade at his Doral Resort. The former president riding alone. A brief wave to supporters and a post on social media. On my way to the courthouse, witch hunt. Outside federal court in Miami, a carnival-like atmosphere. Small groups of supporters and opponents, present but peaceful. Inside, Trump was arrested, fingerprinted electronically, but no mugshot, no handcuffs. He was not ordered to empty his pockets. In the courtroom, the former president found himself just steps away from the man prosecuting him, special counsel Jack Smith, who he has attacked in deeply personal terms. Smith sitting just one row behind Trump, glancing at the former president throughout the hearing, Trump never once looked back. Smith charging Trump with 37 criminal counts, accusing him of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort, in a storage area, a ballroom, even a bathroom. They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Prosecutors argue Trump tried to obstruct the investigation by suggesting his attorney hide or destroy documents, allegedly asking the lawyer, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? In court today, Trump saying not one word. His shoulders slumped, his arms crossed, his face stern. His lawyer entering his plea, not guilty. Sitting at the same table as the former president, one of his closest aides, Walt Nada who has also been charged, allegedly conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation. Nanta at Trump's side over the weekend. He rode in the motorcade today. But at the end of the hearing, the magistrate judge ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any potential witnesses, a group that would certainly include Nada. After about an hour in the courthouse, Trump and Nada leaving together, stopping at a Cuban restaurant in Little Havana. I think it's going great. Okay, let's I think it's a rig deal here. And with one final wave, he was on his way back to Bedminster, where he addressed his supporters tonight. Today we witnessed the most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. And now we head back to New Jersey with ABC's Jay O'Brien. Jay, uh, we got to say, uh, bears repeating, I mean, you had described this as the arraignment party. But this is also the eve of Donald Trump's 78th birthday. Uh, give us a sense of, of what the energy was like there tonight. Yeah, the energy was lively. This is a political event, Lindsay, and as you and I have been talking about, this is much different than the scene that we saw in that Miami courtroom today. Donald Trump, a federal criminal defendant, not looking special counsel, Jack Smith in the eye, and then, of course, getting back on his plane, coming here to New Jersey and delivering a defiant, delivering a fiery speech. One of the last things he told his supporters gathered here before wrapping up his remarks 
was, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you, and saying that he was standing in the way. That is something he frequently says, but it takes on a new life as the former president faces these significant federal charges about mishandling classified documents, about potentially obstructing justice, and of course, there are no, there are not more than one person on that indictment. Well, it's Donald Trump and a co-conspirator, but there's not a group of people on that indictment. There are not Trump supporters on that indictment. It's Donald Trump and a co-conspirator on that indictment. Now, based on, now in relation to those charges, Donald Trump saying that he was a president who was, quote, legally keeping his own documents. But of course, that is not what the special counsel has laid out in that lengthy indictment. They recount an audio recording that they have in which Trump allegedly admitted that he was possessing at least one document that was classified, that he couldn't declassify it. And the special counsel's argument is clear. By virtue of that document and the hundred plus others, the hundreds of others that were in, at one point taken here to, Trump ben Metz, to Trump's Bedminster Club and also stored at Mar-a-Lago, those documents being in fundamentally unsecure locations were, are the crux of that indictment, what makes that action the special counsel says illegal. And that is what Trump is facing here, Lindsay. And I just have to point out, Jay, for a moment, just the striking contrast, the gravity and historic nature of the day. And over your shoulder, you have the crowd there gathered to listen to the president dancing to YMCA. It, give us a sense of, of how that crowd responded as, as uh, the former president talked about how this was politically divisive and a heinous and evil act. Well, this was a crowd that cheered right along with him, Lindsay. This is a crowd of Trump supporters, obviously, a number of Trump donors. There was a pre-planned donor event for here at Trump's Bedminster Club for tonight. And then, of course, it dovetailed with this arraignment today. And then there are minor MAGA celebrities in the crowd as well, the likes of Mike Lindell, the likes of Cash Patel, et cetera, et cetera. But also, Lindsay, it's worth pointing out, this speech was full of Trumpian political rhetoric, uh, speaking ill of the special counsel, talking about how he had every legal right to have these documents, rhetoric in all. But that rhetoric, the rubber's going to meet the road, because in a courtroom, which is the other venue that Trump is facing, it's the facts that matter, and he's got to deal with the facts of what the special counsel has brought forward. Of course, we will be following this in the coming months and potentially years ahead. Jay O'Brien, our thanks to you. And now let's get straight to ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran. Terry, uh, what's the takeaway from uh, Trump's comments at tonight's event? Well, then we better fasten our seatbelts because we're going to hear a lot more like that. What Donald Trump is trying to do is turn his own rages and hatreds into the platform of the Republican Party. He wants Republicans to buy into his view that this prosecution and all others, that any questioning of him at all is an attack on them, on the voters who chose him in 2016, who stood by him in 2020, and are still with him today. And that is his strategy. That's his strategy for political success. We'll see if it works. That's his strategy for survival in court. If he can convince Republicans to go along with him, if he can convince voters or other candidates, and Republicans win, he'll get off. And I, I think that's in his mind. But there's no question that he wants to hardwire his own fury into his voters. And in contrast to the upbeat and defiant candidate that Trump, uh, Trump that we saw tonight in court today, uh, he was stoic and silent, letting his attorney enter his plea on, on his behalf. Is that a reflection, do you think, of, of the serious nature of the charges that he faces? It is, and it is consistent with the, with the behavior of every defendant I've seen in criminal cases. I've seen lots of criminal trials, and I must say, regardless of the circumstances of the crimes that the person is accused of, I always felt compassion for someone standing there. The whole world is coming down around, uh, on them, especially in federal court. This is the government of the United States prosecuting you. They don't lose very much, and they have clearly got their ducks in a row here. And so what you're seeing there is not only his awareness of the seriousness of the charges, but of his own personal peril. He is facing the prospect, doubt it would happen to a first offender, but you never know, of dying in prison because of the seriousness of these charges and the sentences that they carry. Uh, really grim to, to think about it that way. Uh, former Governor Chris Christie last night uh, accused Trump of, of thrusting the nation into another extraordinarily divisive moment. The political divide is already so wide in this country. Uh, do you expect, Terry, that this is just going to make it even wider? 
I, it'll make it sharper, that's for sure. The, the tens of millions of Americans who stand by Donald Trump, no matter what, are going to be whipped into a fury by what happens to him in this case and in others. Remember, there's more coming, uh, not just in New York, but possibly in Atlanta, and then the January 6th special counsel investigation. He's going to have a lot of legal trouble. It will increase the divide there. But I think, once again, I think most Americans are looking for answers to today's issues, their challenges in their lives today. Not just that they support Donald Trump and they don't like what's happening to him, but how are they going to pay for health care for their parents or, or college for their kids. Those are going to be the issues that Donald Trump is going to have to offer something more than his own rage and hatreds. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you. I want to bring back in ABC's John Santucci. And John, we saw the former president's uh, remarks tonight once again, calling this a, a, a political persecution, yeah. suggesting uh, that, the, uh, again, that the election had been stolen before. This is another attempt to steal it. it are critics just going to say, look, this is he's a one-trick pony. This is all we're going to be able to get from him for the duration of this campaign. Well, it's not even critics. It's so far, it's all we've seen, right? I mean, he launched his campaign November 2022. So far, we've been on the trail for roughly seven months. And when he is out, when he's talking, this is the only thing that is sticking out because it's all he focuses on. He focuses on the investigations and he focuses on as he says, rigged, stolen election of the past, can't let that happen again. If those are the only two soundtracks that we're going to hear for the next 18 months, you got to imagine that people are going to get bored by it. So they've got to find a way to punch through it. They have a small campaign team right now. He does not want to make it much bigger, but that is something that people are impressing upon him, that if you do want to do that, because you need two things here to punch through, right? You need voters, you need supporters, you need donors. And that is what the big event tonight is. Because remember, though he's doing this event at Bedminster, this event was originally designed as a donor event. It was on the calendar weeks ago. It was supposed to happen. So they know, Team Trump, that that is the other side of the puzzle here. They need to have the money come in. They're going to have a lot of expenses coming up. Donald Trump knows what it's like to campaign for president. He's done it twice. It does require support, requires the funds. What are you hearing from uh, Trump, your sources within the Trump uh, circle, as far as his reaction to today's uh, court appearance and the charges against him? Well, defiant is the word that everybody keeps using with me. They said afterwards he was quiet, calm. Uh, that stop at that restaurant in Little Havana in Miami uh, bolstered him quite a bit, brought his spirits up. And then uh, traveling back up to New Jersey, he was surrounded by aides, allies, advisors. Uh, only one member of the Trump family was on the flight, Eric Trump, uh, and everybody had McDonald's, a signature meal for the former president, uh, as he was watching news coverage. But I do think, Lindsay, overall, the heaviness of this. It is all weighing on Donald Trump. And they know right now that the thing they need to do is bolster the legal team. We know that they went down to Florida a day before this indictment because they needed to bring more members onto the team. Interviews were happening on Monday and earlier on Tuesday. A team is still not set. John Santucci, our thanks to you. Thank you. And now let's bring in ABC News legal contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Khan, thanks for coming back. As the former President uh, Trump uh, just finished up his speech tonight, uh, can public statements that he's making go forward potentially impact the trial and the charges that he faces? Um, they could. Uh, I think we know that uh, Donald Trump is an evidence-creating machine. Every time he opens his mouth, DOJ is going to be listening. Prosecutors all across the country in Georgia and New York are going to be listening. So it's very perilous for him to be speaking. From what I heard, however, of what he spoke about tonight, seems to me that he's actually following his defense attorney's advice. He's keeping his statements about the case very general, and it's about rhetoric. It's not about, and it hasn't been thus far, he hasn't said anything about the specific allegations, the specific facts set forth in the indictment. So he is you know, walking that fine line and speaking about the case. Right, it does seem like he's avoiding the facts of the case. Now let's take a look at the, the charges against the former president again. How strong of a case has the Justice Department made in their 37 count indictment as far as the quality and, and quantity of evidence? Uh, it's it's strong on all counts. It's on, it sits on all fours here. Um, my review of the indictment and the specific allegations in the indictment say to me that this is a very, very 
rock solid case that DOJ has brought. They've put forth evidence, if proven, and facts if proven, that show Donald Trump intentionally and willingly uh, committed these crimes. Um, they show intent. They, there are different types of evidence here. It's not just one type of evidence is not just one witness. It looks to be multiple witnesses. It looks to be that they have a recording of Donald Trump himself talking about these classified documents. They have text messages. So this is really a potpourri. This is, frankly, prosecutor gold, the evidence that's set forth in this indictment. Uh, former Trump Attorney General Bill Barr said recently that it showed, quote, egregious obstruction and that if even half of it is true, then he is toast. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? That's a very fair assessment. Uh, I actually feel for the defense team in this case. They are facing a lot of evidence and they're going to have to make a lot of moves to try to beat back this evidence. And I think really where they're going to have to fight is in the motion practice to try to get some of this evidence excluded. Because if it comes in, I really don't see how the, the DOJ can end up with anything other than a conviction. How much of this ultimately comes down to intent on, on the part of the former president? It's absolutely about intent here. Um, and what DOJ has set forth in the indictment are specific allegations and facts that show that Donald Trump knew what he was doing was wrong. So I think if they can prove those things, if they can show those facts that support intent and the criminal intent that they set forth in the indictment, I, I think they're going to win. Con nowadays, our thanks to you as always. Now I want to bring back in ABC's Catherine Falders in Washington for us. Catherine, as Trump faced these charges today, he's still working to build out his legal team. What's the latest on where things stand with that tonight? Yeah, we know that for weeks they have been informally laying the groundwork to bring more lawyers on board. This was before uh, those previous lawyers had departed. But we know today that two of those lawyers, Chris Kyes and Todd Blanche, who are representing him today in court, they also represent Trump in different legal matters in New York. They were there today. Uh, but the reality is that the Trump team has been interviewing people over the weekend. They continued to interview additional lawyers yesterday with the current legal team and the former president. They they still haven't found somebody uh, that they need to bring on to this team. But uh, defense attorneys that I've uh, been talking to here say that this is much bigger than just bringing one additional person on board. This is a big case, Lindsay. They need a lot of legal firepower here. And they have interviewed people who have turned down this case. They haven't been able to secure one additional attorney. Now, they're confident they are talking to people. But this is a matter that is going to require a big team of people, lawyers with national security, uh, experienced lawyers with security clearance to uh, view classified documents, for example. So this is continuing. They're continuing to talk to additional people. They hope to have this nailed down in the coming days. And what about that key aide, Walt Nauta? Uh, we saw him right by Trump's side today. What comes next for him on the charges that he faces and, and making his own defense? Yeah, Nada is this key aide who played a role in this alleged criminal scheme here. He faces six charges, including uh, that conspiracy charge, conspiracy to uh, obstruct. Now, in court, he was there today, Lindsay, with Trump. One of his lawyers who has represented him in this matter, Stanley Woodward, was also there with him. But he did not enter a plea today. This was a initial appearance. They asked for the arraignment to be delayed until he finds local counsel in Florida. So he is also looking uh, for an additional lawyer that arraignment has been delayed and he will show back up there in court uh, to be arraigned in the next two weeks Lindsay Catherine folders for us reporting in from Washington headquarters there thank you now let's bring back in ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Asha Rangappa uh, now an assistant dean at Yale's Jackson School of Global Affairs is there anything that the former president said tonight uh, that you believe would make matters worse for him legally potentially well, shockingly, I did not hear anything tonight, but restraint is not one of President's, President Trump's fortes. Um, and I think as long as he continues to speak out, he carries the risk that he's going to provide self-incriminating evidence that can be used against him. There is a reason that we have a constitutional right to remain silent. Not everyone uses that right. Uh, Trump is one of those people. And we've seen, for example, in the CNN town hall that he 
participated in several weeks ago. He said that he had taken the documents, that they belonged to him. In an interview with Sean Hannity, he said similar things. And these just don't help him. Um, but unfortunately for him, he's because he is a candidate for office, he has to both play in the court of public opinion and also uh, balance that with the court of law. And I think in that tension, he typically favors the court of public opinion, maybe at the expense of uh, his own defense. And, and when we look at the types of classified documents at the center of these charges, how significant is it that so many of these documents are related to military matters and even about nuclear weapons? How does that impact the case? Well, it create, it strengthens the case for the jury. But I also want to emphasize, just as someone who did counterintelligence investigations, beyond his criminal liability, I, I think it's important to not forget the actual risk that this poses to national security, because these were unsecured documents at a location that was frequented by 10, you know, 10,000 people, I think, in the indictment, it said, including foreign nationals. And there have been people who have been arrested at Mar-a-Lago, uh, who have been suspected as of being foreign agents in 2019, a Chinese businesswoman uh, just last year, uh, uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainian with two fake passports. I think we have to be really concerned about who may have gained access to these documents, whether or not this case actually proceeds all the way to the end uh, for criminal liability. Let's talk about one specific piece of evidence, and that's the audio recording of the former president talking about some of those classified documents that he had in his possession, where he reportedly says, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. How significant is that comment? That comment is very significant because it shows that he knew that he possessed declass or, uh, classified information. In other words, this is not something that people packed up and was just lying around Mar-a-Lago. He had no idea. He knew that he possessed it. He was actually using it to uh, show off. And also he knew that they were classified. This really undercuts his defense that he's put out there several times, as his defenders have, that he somehow secretly and telepathically declassified these documents before he left. Clearly, he understood that there was a process that he had to go through before he left to do that. And, and at least in the case of the whatever document he's referring to in this audio tape, he did it. So this is really, once again, just like his public comments, it it really you know, pins him into a corner in terms of what he can argue in his defense with these very, very serious charges against him. And just give us a sense of, of what you can expect on, on timing and strategy on, on both sides as this case moves forward. I think this is going to be a very lengthy case. Uh, look, the fact that he's actually still looking for lawyers, and we can pause for a moment and just say how extraordinary it is that a former president of the United States has trouble finding lawyers. This is typically the kind of case that would make a lawyer's career, but we've seen that often his lawyers get implicated in the cases, uh, as they were in this case. One of his former lawyers, Evan Corcoran, eventually had to testify in front of the grand jury for uh, essentially helping to um, conceal some of the information. So I think that alone is going to delay it. And then we have all the procedural hurdles before we even start to see the semblance of a trial. Asha Rangappa, we thank you so much for your insight and your time tonight. Appreciate it. And joining us now for more is Republican presidential hopeful and former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson. Governor, thanks so much for your time tonight. Uh, it's good to be with you. Thank you. So you're a former federal prosecutor. Obviously, this is unprecedented case as we continue to describe it that way. Uh, you've now had the opportunity to read the indictment. Do you think that federal prosecutors have a strong case? I do. Uh, whenever you look at the specificity that's laid out in the indictment, it's a very strong case. Obviously, uh, this is going to have to be tried. You've got to prove all of that. But as Bill Barr said, if if half of that is proved, uh, then it's a very devastating case that's being presented against the former president. I'm very pleased that there's been more Republican leaders step up and say, this is serious, we're not going to dismiss this lightly, particularly when you have service men and women that are held to, a, to the same standard and are held accountable if they violate that. And so this is a, a serious matter both uh, from the, for the criminal justice system, but also for uh, selecting the future leader of the country. And so I'm delighted that more uh, 
leaders are showing courage and saying this is serious and we should not dismiss it lightly. Do you have any idea if this case would have the likelihood that it would be decided before the 2024 election or, or before the primary season? Well, I've actually uh, tried cases in which uh, classified information was involved, and it does add a level of complexity because you have to have the clearances, you have to have the protection as you exchange uh, the information as you get ready for trial. And so it is more complex than, than normal. But I hope that uh, the judges and the courts understand that you have to be fair to the defendant and give them uh, the right to prepare, but at the same time there's extraordinary public interest for our nation in getting this issue resolved in a timely fashion. The Speedy Trial Act applies not just to protect the defendant, but it also applies to give the public uh, protection and assurance that justice is not going to be delayed. And so uh, I think that it's going to continue through the campaign season. Uh, you're going to be looking at debates in August. You're going to be looking at primaries next year. And uh, former President Trump is likely to have court appearances during that time. It'll be interested to see whether the, the court's trying to accommodate his campaign schedule or whether they're going to insist upon compliance with the court schedule in a timely hearing of this case. Uh, what do you think about some of the, the fellow Republicans who are also running for president, uh, who are promising pardons uh, for, for President Trump, former President Trump? Do you feel that that's appropriate? It is wrong. Uh, it is unjustified. It is a bad precedent. Uh, they're politically pandering uh, to get votes using the federal pardon power. So no, it incenses me as somebody who's had to use the pardon power as governor and respects that power as president, and you don't use it as a campaign uh, wedge issue or a campaign tool. So I'm offended by that as someone who loves our justice system in America, and it's wrong uh, for candidates to be promising that, whether it's to a former president or whether it's to an average Joe that's out there. Uh, you just don't do that during a campaign. I want our candidates to show more courage and to speak out about this and provide leadership. Trump currently, as you well know, remains the front runner for the 2024 nomination on the Republican side. You've called out, uh, called on him to drop out of the race. Uh, that does not appear that that would be likely at all. But would you support him if he is nominated? Well, I'm not going to support somebody who's convicted of a felony, particularly one as involving the secrets of the United States. That's not reflective of who our commander chief should be and our national character and the high regard that we have for our military and those that collect these secrets. And so uh, we'll see how the debate develops uh, and how the case develops. Uh, and I'm not going to be supporting somebody who is convicted or who has uh, wrongfully uh, handled a material that jeopardizes the security of the United States. Governor, is that to say that you would support him if he is not convicted? Well, I don't expect him to be the nominee, and I want to be on the debate stage, so I expect that uh, we're going to be uh, negotiating this language to assure that uh, there's not going to be a circumstance that we're bound to support somebody who is convicted of a very serious felony that uh, violates the uh, high office of president and the handling of classified material. That's very important for our country, and no candidate should take that lightly. So let's see how that develops. Uh, but I want to be on that debate stage, and I hope there's that opportunity. We've also got to have 40,000 donors. And so I hope everybody goes to asa2024.com, helps me to get on that debate stage. Just want to take one more swing at it, Governor. You would consider, if he's not convicted, supporting him? Uh, I want to look at what we have to do, what the language of that is. I haven't seen the language of the pledge yet, so that's still under negotiation. And I hope it's something that I can live with because I want to be on the debate stage, but there's certain principles you don't cross. Uh, there are at least 12 candidates currently in the race. Are you worried that this is 2016 all over again, too many candidates, and that your participation in the race would only allow Trump to, to become the nominee should you drop out? Well, uh, people understand who Donald Trump is. Uh, I think the fact that there's uh, 11 other candidates in the race reflect that 
Uh, there's a lot of leaders that want a different nominee than Donald Trump, and we want to beat Joe Biden, and he's not the right one to do it. So there's almost a unanimity uh, in that message. Uh, as far as the number, that's going to sort out uh, over time. That's what Iowa sorts out. That's what New Hampshire does. As I talk to the voters in New Hampshire most recently, uh, they're telling me this is serious. Uh, they believe that it is uh, political and a double standard here, but they also treat it as very serious and something that uh, they're not taking lightly and will be a factor as they make their decision uh, going into the uh, primary and caucus season. Presidential hopeful and Governor Asa Hutchinson, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Good to be with you. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, nearly two dozen troops injured overseas. We'll tell you where. The next, tired of feeling like, remember that old Tupac rap line, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents? We update you on our nation's inflation. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Here we have one of the most sensational murders. But very few people have actually heard about this case. It's the purest form of evil you're gonna get. They had a pact. If either spouse were to cheat, the cheating spouse would have to kill their lover or be killed. Now, Friday night, go inside a haunting murder mystery as it unravels. That's the stuff of horror movies. Yeah. The all-new 2020 true crime event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. At Boston Logan Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Donald Trump's historic federal arraignment has been front and center today, and we will go back to that in a few moments. But now some other major headlines that we're following across the country. Crews are working around the clock in Philadelphia to clean up that highway collapse caused by a fuel tank truck that exploded on an underpass. And tonight we are seeing new video of the moments of the crash. ABC's Janae Norman has the latest. 
night as crews demolish what remains of that fire damaged I-95 overpass. Investigators are reviewing this new video showing the moment the fire ignited as they try to determine what caused that tanker truck hauling gasoline to crash and explode in a fireball under the overpass early Sunday. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg getting a first-hand look at the destruction today, vowing to rebuild fast. The only thing that's even more important than making sure it's restored quickly is making sure it's restored safely. Experts say that inferno likely reached far greater temperatures than the 932 degrees that could cause steel in the overpass to lose a significant amount of its strength. Officials say it could take months to rebuild this overpass. Business owners say the collapse costing them customers. I'm losing a lot of money and government should take action quick and do something because it's not just me. The economic impact likely to be felt far from the collapse site. And Lindsay, Secretary Buttigieg says shipping costs could go up on the East Coast as trucks take longer detours to avoid the collapse. Officials here plan to announce their plans to redo that overpass tomorrow. Lindsay. Janae, thank you. Overseas, 22 U.S. soldiers were injured in a military helicopter accident in Syria. The Pentagon says no enemy fire was reported, but 15 of the injured have been evacuated for higher care. Here's ABC's James Longman. Tonight, the U.S. military says it's investigating a helicopter mishap that's left 22 U.S. service members injured in northeastern Syria. This was an MH-47 Chinook um, that had a problem with one rotor that caused a hard landing. The U.S. military says no enemy fire was reported at the time. The incident Sunday left service members with injuries of various degrees, according to U.S. Central Command. A U.S. official tells ABC News 15 were transferred to a military hospital in Germany. As of right now, uh, all of the service members involved in that crash are in stable condition. This comes after officials ordered a 24-hour stand-down of all aviation units back in April to focus on safety protocols. That order followed three helicopter crashes since February that killed 14 service members. There are roughly 900 U.S. soldiers in Syria right now helping partner forces in the fight against ISIS. Lindsay, the investigation into what caused this crash is ongoing. U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq helped with 38 missions against ISIS in May alone. Lindsay? James, thank you. Data released today shows that U.S. inflation may be leaving the sky-high days behind. Consumer prices rose 4% last month compared to a year ago. That's the slowest annual pace since March of 2021 and slightly better than expected. The fresh data comes a day before the Federal Reserve meets to announce its latest rate decision and bolsters hopes that the Fed may pause its rate hiking campaign. Next tonight to the severe weather for 16 million Americans from Texas to Florida. We've seen damaging winds, massive hail, and an isolated tornado. And tonight there's a heat wave brewing with temperatures over 100 degrees possible in some places. Our chief meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking it all. Hey, Ging. Hey there. You know, Lindsay, we've already had a reported tornado in Stratford, Texas. We've had tennis ball-sized hail from Pecan Hill, Texas, which is just south of Dallas, over to Shreveport. So you're going to see more of that big hail tonight. The severe thunderstorm watches also include the Florida panhandle over to Savannah. But you see how that front is stationary? It's got both the warm front symbol and the cold front. Well, that means stationary, meaning it's not going to move much. And the next 24 hours, you're going to have another afternoon and the evening of even more enhanced severe storms. So do expect more of that baseball size or bigger hail and some damaging winds, Jackson, Montgomery, and Albany, Georgia. That's just going to get a little more oomph from the atmosphere. That's from that jet stream, but below that jet, and it's a very active subtropical jet, you have serious heat and a heat dome that's building into what could be a dangerous weekend and really week of temperatures that are in the heat index up to 114. I mean, that's the thing is if you have one or two days this time of year, okay. But when you're exposed, especially for prolonged times, look at the dates on the bottom there. Through Saturday in Houston, a heat indice of 110. So it looks like it breaks down early next week, but that's a long time for folks to be enduring that heat there in Texas. Lindsay? Really hot temperatures there. Ginger, our thanks to you. So much more to get to. Coming up, the literary world loses yet another iconic author. But next, we break down former President Trump's second arraignment for you by the numbers.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give me love jelly roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Former President Trump's arraignment today marks a historic moment. Let's take a look at the scope and scale of it by the numbers. Trump is now the first former president to be indicted on federal charges to which he pleaded not guilty today. Trump faces charges of violating seven federal laws and was arraigned on a total of 37 counts related to classified documents that he retained after he left office. That includes 31 charges for the willful retention of national defense information charged for each secret or top secret classified document that that is the focus of the investigation. He also faces three separate charges related to withholding or concealing a document and another three charges for conspiracy to obstruct justice, a scheme to conceal and false statements and representations. The unauthorized retention of national defense information falls under part of the Espionage Act, a 1917 federal anti-spying law passed shortly after the U.S. entered World War I. It has most frequently been used in recent years for the prosecution of government employees for a leak 
leaking national security secrets, such as the 2013 charges against Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning was sentenced to 35 years for the leaking of classified information to WikiLeaks, although her sentence was later commuted by former President Obama. As for Trump, the maximum punishment for each count of unlawful retention of documents is 10 years in prison, while some of the obstruction and concealing evidence charges can carry punishments of up to 20 years each, but experts say that federal defendants are rarely given the maximum punishment. And we should note that today's federal indictment comes after Trump was indicted in April on 34 counts in New York related to alleged hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels, which was the first time a former president had ever been indicted. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. Officers race against time to help a desperate mother save her daughter. And we tell you about the latest scam that has one state's attorney general sounding the alarm. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Here we have one of the most sensational murders, but very few people have actually heard about this case. It's the purest form of evil you're gonna get. They had a pact. If either spouse were to cheat, the cheating spouse would have to kill their lover or be killed. Now, Friday night, go inside a haunting murder mystery as it unravels. That's the stuff of horror movies. Yeah. The all-new 2020 true crime event, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. Now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. A mother's desperate plea to save her daughter, a Costco recall, and a new album by The Beatles. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Is it 
dramatic body camera video shows Utah police officers rescuing a 12-year-old girl who is trapped in a car underwater. She's 12? Yes. Hey, take your boots off. We're doing this. The video shows Tooele cops arriving where witnesses were screaming for help. The officers are seen taking their boots off before going into the water. Though much of the rescue isn't seen, officers are heard shooting into the car in order to get inside. The gun! Give me the gun! Hurry! Please! She's in the feed! Officers pulled the girl out and performed CPR before she was taken to the hospital. We got her out of the car! We're starting CPR! We're starting CPR! KTVX reports that she was in stable condition. Sentencing has been delayed for rapper Tory Lanez and the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion. The sentencing hearing was originally scheduled for today, but moved to August 7th after Lanez's defense team filed a motion for continuance, which was granted. Lanez was convicted last year on multiple felony charges for shooting and injuring Megan Thee Stallion in July 2020. He faces up to 22 years and eight months in prison. A voluntary recall has been issued on large bags of frozen fruit sold at Costco over hepatitis A concerns. Wawona Frozen Foods issued the recall, which includes packages of the company's organic Daybreak blend distributed between April and June 2022. A notice on the FDA website said those packages contain strawberries grown in Mexico that may have the potential to be contaminated by hepatitis A. The products were sold in Costco stores in five different states. Wawona Frozen Foods said the recall was out of an abundance of caution and that no illnesses had been reported. A police chase for a carjacking suspect ended at a Houston school. Police said officers were pursuing a suspect who carjacked the vehicle and eventually caused a rollover crash when he collided with another vehicle. The suspect then allegedly fled on foot to the Harmony School campus nearby. The school, which was hosting summer classes at the time, went into secure mode. An official said the suspect was detained within 10 minutes with all students and staff safe. Olympic gold medal sprinter Tori Bowie died from childbirth complications, says the autopsy. The Associated Press says the medical examiner's report found Bowie was an estimated eight months pregnant and showing signs of labor at the time of her death and may have had respiratory complications and seizures. Bowie was found dead May 2nd. She was 32. She won gold, silver, and bronze medals at the 2016 Summer Olympic Games. New music from The Beatles is on the horizon. Yes, those Beatles. In an interview with BBC Radio, Paul McCartney said that artificial intelligence allowed him to produce what he calls the final Beatles record, more than five decades after the iconic group originally split. He said the technology was used to extricate the late John Lennon's voice from an old demo. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI so that then we could mix the record as you would normally do. The song is expected to be released later this year. Identity theft is on the rise, and the Attorney General's office in Chicago says they've seen a huge increase in cases, specifically unemployment insurance fraud, one of their fastest-growing problems. Here's our Alex Perez. I was surprised and concerned. Ed Dudley says he was in disbelief when he received at least five of these letters stating he had applied for unemployment benefits. I hadn't filed an unemployment claim. When the first one came, I thought perhaps it was just a one-off. But then not too long after that, I received uh, yet another email. Dudley, who lives in the Chicago suburbs, says most of the claims under his name were denied. But he says he did receive an email saying at least one claim was processed to an unknown bank account for more than $800. This type of identity theft is so rampant. Our Chicago station WLS reporter Jason Knowles and the ABC 7i team have heard from hundreds of local people who say they are also victims of unemployment fraud. The Illinois AG's office says the scam varies, but here's one way they say these criminals are preying on the unsuspecting. A scammer gets your personal info through places like the dark web. They then file an unemployment claim using that info and tie the claim to a bank account the scammer can access. Suddenly, you're getting an email or letter in the mail that says you've applied for unemployment insurance, but you never did. These scams are so rampant, even Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul was targeted. I was the victim of it myself, where I received a debit card in the mail as a result of somebody filing for unemployment benefits in my name. 
In A.G. Raul's case, he believes the scammers were trying to change the mailing address to get the funds sent to themselves, but failed. In a lot of cases, sometimes it's a small-time actors on a local level, but sometimes it's international actors, so it's difficult to, to crack sometimes. But uh, we've been successful in, 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 in some cases. Ed Dudley says he was never able to figure out how exactly his identity was stolen, but hopes by coming forward he can motivate others to better protect their information and avoid falling victim. Our thanks to Alex Perez. And if this happens to you, to help protect yourself, the Department of Labor says that you should monitor your credit report and sign up for identity theft alerts in case thieves use your information against you in other ways, like opening up credit cards. And the U.S. Postal Inspection Service says to report the fraud. Otherwise, it could impact you if you need to file for unemployment. And we learned today Pulitzer Prize winning author Cormac McCarthy has died. The best selling author known for such titles as All the Pretty Horses, No Country for Old Men, and The Road was widely regarded as one of the greatest writers in American history. Cormac McCarthy was 89. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran joins us now. And Terry, we now have a twice indicted former president of the United States. Give us a sense of the historic nature that played out yet again today. Unprecedented, Lindsay. That's the word that kept coming up that everyone was using because it's right. Uh, we've never seen anything like this in American history, but that's in part because we've never seen anything like Donald Trump. Uh, he is the most dominant figure in American politics. He, uh, the whole political discussion revolves around Donald Trump and about what he stands for. We haven't seen anything like him you know, since Reagan or FDR, but unlike them, uh, this is a man with profound character flaws. And don't take my word for it. The people who worked for him in his own administration say that. And the combination of his towering influence in American politics, tens of millions of Republicans, you know, will go uh, lie down in traffic for him. Uh, and these character flaws that, that, end, that land him in so much trouble, this time criminal charges in a federal court. You know, we've never seen anything like that. We are in uncharted waters for sure. I want to just look at an ABC News Washington Post poll that found that uh, when people were asked if Trump should suspend his campaign, 46 percent said that he should. So uh, we're talking about nearly half said that they should. Uh, 38 percent said that he should not, which is a significant amount. Uh, 16 percent said that they didn't know. I wanted to pick up on a point that you said earlier today, Terry. You talked about how he's making this personal trial part of his political identity. Uh, just to explain what you mean by that. It is. I think those numbers reflect basically the divide in the country with some independence in the middle. But what you're hearing from Donald Trump is that this election is going to be about this case, this prosecution. He wants to tell his supporters and, and beyond that the prosecution of him is the persecution of them, that he is taking uh, the shots, the arrows on their behalf, because the same elite that failed them, is what he will say, is trying to go after him because he's the only one who can rescue the people who feel the country's in the wrong direction. That's a lot of people. And so his political plan is to make this election about this case. Uh, it'll be difficult because, you know, courts don't operate at the speed or in the way that politicians do. Uh, the country will move on to new issues, new challenges. This case is from yesterday. And I think the challenge for Donald Trump is to make him relevant for 2024, not 2020 or 2016. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you as always. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, wake up with Selma Hayek. Good morning, America. And this week, Garth Brooks has something new to announce, and he's doing it on GMA. Plus, a super summer deals and steal. That is great. All on Good Morning America. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi!
this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. It is a historic prosecution that Donald Trump is calling a persecution. We begin tonight with this poignant moment in American history. A former president in court today facing criminal charges from the very government he was once elected to lead. Today, Trump entered a plea of not guilty to a sprawling 37-count criminal indictment. Traveling to the Miami courthouse alone this afternoon, Trump was seen waving at the window. The former president was fingerprinted, but no mugshot was taken. Then, for the first time, Trump came face to face with special counsel Jack Smith. Magistrate Judge Jonathan Goodman, who oversaw the hearing, ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any witnesses. Outside of the court, there was a festive like atmosphere. Most of the hundreds who showed up were there to support Trump, while others were there in protest. So, what comes next as this historic legal showdown plays out right in the middle of the 2024 campaign season? Our team is standing by to break it all down tonight, and we begin with our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, in Miami. Donald Trump this morning walking to his motorcade at his Doral Resort, the former president riding alone, a brief wave to supporters, and a post on social media. On my way to the courthouse, witch hunt. Outside federal court in Miami, a carnival-like atmosphere. Small groups of supporters and opponents, present but peaceful. Inside, Trump was arrested, fingerprinted electronically, but no mugshot, no handcuffs. He was not ordered to empty his pockets. In the courtroom, the former president found himself just steps away from the man prosecuting him, special counsel Jack Smith, who he has attacked in deeply personal terms. Smith sitting just one row behind Trump, glancing at the former president throughout the hearing, Trump never once looked back. Smith charging Trump with 37 criminal counts, accusing him of illegally keeping sensitive classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago resort in a storage area, a ballroom, even a bathroom. They allegedly included secrets about United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. Prosecutors argue Trump tried to obstruct the investigation by suggesting his attorney hide or destroy documents, allegedly asking the lawyer, wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? In court today, Trump saying not one word. His shoulders slumped, his arms crossed, his face stern. His lawyer entering his plea, not guilty. Sitting at the same table as the former president, one of his closest aides, Walt Nada, who has also been charged, allegedly conspiring with his boss to obstruct the investigation. Nanta at Trump's side over the weekend. He rode in the motorcade today. But at the end of the hearing, the magistrate judge ordered Trump not to discuss the case with any potential witnesses, a group that would certainly include Nada. After about an hour in the courthouse, Trump and Nada leaving together, stopping at a Cuban restaurant in Little Havana. Food for everyone. Food for everyone. 
Trump sounding a beat as he headed to the airport. I think it's going great. Okay, I think it's a rig deal here. And with one final wave, he was off. We'll be seeing a lot more of him for sure. Rachel Scott joins us now from Miami. Rachel, you were inside that courtroom today. We only have the sketches, but I have to imagine that it was quite a striking scene for you to witness with your own eyes. Mm -hmm. It was unprecedented, Lindsay. We have never seen anything like this before. And one thing that was striking, the special counsel, Jack Smith, repeatedly glancing over at former President Donald Trump. Trump never once turned around to look back at him. The former president did not utter a single word, but he did not have to. His arms were crossed. His shoulders were slumped. He had to wait about 15 minutes for the judge to start today's arraignment. And at times, he appeared restless, even fidgeting with his hands. One thing was very clear. Trump was ready to get this all over with and get back to his 2024 campaign, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And now let's get right to ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Aaron, what are the next steps for Trump here? Well, at the moment, there's no next date in his case, but we imagine the judge will set one soon to start to lay out a motion schedule as the lawyers make their arguments. You could imagine former President Trump's legal team is already thinking about motions to dismiss the case or diminish the charges, maybe throw out certain evidence. Uh, we'll also see what the judge decides to do in terms of keeping the case here in downtown Miami or maybe moving it to Fort Pierce, north of here, where she usually is based. So there's all sorts of different machinations, but it's unlikely, Lindsay, we're going to see former President Trump in this courthouse again anytime soon, maybe not until trial, assuming the case gets that far. And Aaron, today Trump was also dealt a second legal blow. What are the details on that? really stunning because it really underscores, Lindsay, just how many legal entanglements the former president is facing. As he was being arraigned on the indictment here in Miami, a federal judge in New York allowed E. Jean Carroll to amend an existing defamation lawsuit to include more comments that Trump made that were allegedly disparaging to her. These comments came after a jury found Trump liable of sexually assaulting Carroll back in the 1990s. He went on CNN, he went online, he made all these remarks, and now her lawsuit is going to include those remarks and seek $10 million in damages. So as he's fighting a criminal case, he also has civil lawsuits to tend to as well, Lindsay. Aaron Katursky, our thanks to you as always. Some Republican presidential hopefuls like Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy have floated pardons for Trump if he's convicted. Former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who's also running, told us that's a bad idea. It is wrong. Uh, it is unjustified. It is a bad precedent. Uh, they're politically pandering uh, to get votes using the federal pardon power. So, no, it incenses me as somebody who's had to use the pardon power as governor and respects that power as president, and you don't use it as a campaign uh, wedge issue or a campaign tool. So, I'm offended by that as someone who loves our justice system in America, and it's wrong uh, for candidates to be promising that, whether it's to a former president or whether it's to an average Joe that's out there, uh, you just don't do that during a campaign. I want our candidates to show more courage and to speak out about this and provide leadership. All right, now let's bring in ABC News legal contributor Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Khan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, playing off of that pardons conversation there, if former President Trump is convicted but then gets reelected, would he effectively be able to pardon himself? Uh, I don't think he would be able to. I think that would, frankly, be quite unprecedented. But I know we are in uncharted waters. Um, but it is true, even if he's convicted, he can continue to run and he can be elected president, as he said he plans to do. Uh, Chris Christie, uh, obviously the former governor of New Jersey, presidential hopeful himself, has looked at the indictment and he said that it was inexcusable and called it vanity run amok. Uh, charges against the former president, uh, how strong would you say, based on the charges against the former president, how strong of a case would you say that the Justice Department has made in their 37 count indictment as far as the quality and, and quantity of evidence? It is so strong, Lindsay, uh, in my view. 
I do not envy uh, Trump's defense team. It is a very hard road to uh, overcome here. If the government's able to prove all the facts that they've alleged in the indictment, it's in my mind, pretty much an open and shut case. So the case really depends on what these motions are going to be and what evidence may potentially be excluded. And in the motion practice, I think that's where the case may end up being won or lost. I want to give you one other quote, because we had former Trump Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, who said recently that it showed, quote, egregious obstruction, and that if even half of it is true, then he is toast. Would you say that that's a fair assessment? That is very fair. I think anybody who's prosecuted cases, anybody who has defended cases, would look at this indictment and say, oh, my goodness, this is a lot of evidence. And if it was any other person, uh, I think those defense counsel would be talking about a plea with the former president. How much of this comes down to intent on the part of the former president? This whole case depends on intent. And prior to uh, this indictment being filed and released, I think everyone knew that was the issue. And what this indictment shows is that, well, the prosecutors have very good evidence of intent. They have recordings. They have Mr. Trump allegedly um, showing classified documents to witnesses. I totally expect that those witnesses will end up being called to trial and will testify about that. So I think there's very strong evidence of intent. You know, a moment ago, you, you talked about in any other case, basically, with such strong evidence, you might be having the defense talking about a plea deal. You think there's any possible chance of that? Absolutely not. I, I don't see this. Uh, I, I don't even think that uh, DOJ would necessarily entertain a plea. Um, it's their discretion to uh, engage in plea discussions with any defendant. And he is the top defendant here. I think they will engage in plea discussions and potential cooperation with Walt Nada. What kind of strategy do you think that we can expect from both the DOJ and also from Trump's defense? I think from DOJ, they're going to want to move quickly. Uh, I think from de the defense side, I, I think in the defense's interest is that time is their friend. They're going to want to move slowly and deliberately. And I think they're also going to want to keep a unified front with uh, Walt Nada. Um, I think the biggest fear for the Trump defense team is that Nada flips on the former president. And what about the presiding judge in this case? She's a Trump appointee who's given him favorable rulings in the past. What kind of impact could she have on this case and, and how it moves forward? Well, first of all, it should not have any impact. She should be calling balls and strikes. She should be following the law. But, Lindsay, you're absolutely right. In a related case, she seemed to make very favorable rulings uh, in favor of the former president and rulings that did not follow the law. And that for that reason, she got reversed. So I think it remains to be seen how this will play out. But I think going forward, her rulings are going to be scrutinized, heavily scrutinized, as they should be. Khan Nowaday, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And now let's go to our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran. Terry's back with us. Of course, Trump was stoic in court today, didn't utter a word. Moments after leading, he was seemed to be at least upbeat among the supporters there in Little Havana. Uh, the defendant versus the candidate. Is this something that we're going to continue to see, do you think? This kind of Absolutely. split screen? A split screen and the merging personality. The candidate is a defendant. And I think his whole plan of his campaign is to make this case the centerpiece of his message, which has been there really since he came down that elevator in 2015, which is that America is under attack from enemies within, uh, that it is the last chance to save America, to make America great again. And uh, there are millions of people who believe that for reasons good and bad. People who feel that middle class and working class people don't have the same opportunities. People are concerned about the demographics and culture of the country changing. He brings all that together into this highly emotional, self-centered, literally centered on his own destiny uh, argument. And that will be his campaign. My prosecution is the persecution of you. Help me, you help yourself. Tonight's event was planned before the indictment, but in view of today's arraignment, what do you expect to see and, and hear from Trump tonight? Exactly that framing. I, I think it's going to be well staged. He's his, his own producer, as we know uh, beforehand, and I think he's going to be furious. He's going to want to depart from whatever script he's got and really vent, let loose his rage and his frustration 
uh, at these at these charges at this pass that he's come to. I think the trick for him is going to be to keep people on board as the evidence comes out in court, as the jury, if there is a trial, renders its verdict. Can he keep them with him? Right now, it's easy to be angry at the charge of Trump if you're on his side, but if the evidence is as strong as Khan Nowaday and others have have said, can you really maintain that? anger on behalf of Trump, who did this to himself. You know, we keep talking about how we haven't seen anything like this, the unprecedented nature. You know, one thing that I think that is, is also something that I, is surprising many, is certainly Dr. Jill Biden uh, talked about her surprise last night, is that we continue to see, uh, even despite uh, these two arraignments at this point, that he has a widening gap. Trump is, is now leading by more. Uh, he's actually increased uh, his lead against Ron DeSantis. Is that also something that, that is just uh, so striking for our country right now? Uh, I, I think it speaks to the divide, doesn't it? That, that there is an assumption upon the majority of the majority of Republicans that anything, quote, the establishment, unquote, does, and that means anybody who disagrees with their support of Trump uh, does, is illegitimate. That even the workings of a grand jury uh, in Florida is illegitimate, and unless Trump is acquitted, the case is illegitimate. And that is how he has bound the Republican Party to his own personal destiny, for better and worse. They won in 2016 with him. They lost in 2018, 2020, 2022 as well. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Still much more to get to. Coming up, Mexico could have its first female president ever. Plus, Jeffrey host Ken Jennings joins us on the show's legacy and takes us on a journey through the afterlife. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko says Russian tactical nuclear weapons are due to be deployed in the country within days. The deployment will be Moscow's first move of the short-range warhead since the fall of the Soviet Union. It comes at the request of Lukashenko and in response to the U.S. deployment of similar weapons in Western Europe over many decades. The mayor of Mexico City announced that she will step down this Friday to seek the ruling party's presidential nomination. If elected, she would become the country's first female president. 
Early polls have shown Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum with a slight advantage in the race for the nomination. And BTS fans from around the world are gathering in Seoul to celebrate the K-pop boy band's 10th anniversary. The city illuminated landmarks and the group's signature color purple in tribute. BTS is taking a temporary break as two of the members complete their military service. But that is not stopping their army from flocking to celebrate their favorite idols. Our next guest is taking us on a journey through the afterlife, exploring 5,000 years of human history from the ancient Egyptian underworld to the literary world of C.S. Lewis's Narnia. And he also happens to be the host of Jeopardy. Ken Jennings has no limits in his new book, 100 Places to See After You Die. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So the basic premise here is the bucket list after you've kicked the bucket. I explain how you came up with this idea. Well, I was in an airport and I saw one of those travel guides. You know, they always have these books that tell you a thousand things you have to do before you die. But for some reason, I was looking at it upside down and I thought it said a thousand places to die before you see. And I thought, hey, that would be a book, you know, instead of a travel guide to Rome or Thailand, you know, it's, it's where to eat in Dante's Inferno or where to stay in Valhalla or the good place. I always loved these fictional depictions of heaven and hell when I was a kid. And you really delve into all these different iterations of death and the afterlife that, as we've seen it depicted in movies and books and TV shows. How did you go about researching this? It was research intensive. I mean, I didn't actually die and come back, but I did spend a lot of time in libraries looking up old Buddhist sutras and ancient um, medieval texts of uh, mystics who said they'd been to the next world watched every episode, you know, binged every episode of TV shows about the next world, like Leftovers or The Good Place or Dead Like Me. Um, I feel like I am ready to go whenever, you know, if, I, if a bus hits me today, I know more than I, I ever needed to. Have you, did you interview anybody who says that they have died and came back? I wanted to stay away from that because it's kind of a, that's a different kind of book. You know, okay. the people who, who have these firsthand testimonies. I guess I did for people who had lived like hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Like Emanuel Swedenborg wrote a very detailed book about here are the little communities that form after death and you can even get married and here's what the language sounds like. It's a little bit like Hebrew. A lot of these places have enough detail in them that you can, you can write about them like it's a travel guide. And you actually have a quote here from uh, Harry Potter and, and I want to read it here uh, talking about the afterlife. Of course it's happening inside your head but why on earth should that mean that it is not real? Do you believe that the afterlife exists? I think there's something to that. I would say my conviction about the afterlife is I'm very hopeful about it because it, it just seems like it, it's such a waste if we're here and we're conscious and then it all, it all just goes away. Um, so I would love for that to be true. But even if it's not, it can still be real, like the Harry Potter quote says. You know, it kind of determines how we live, live our lives here, what we value. Our afterlives say a lot about our culture, and then they determine our culture. And you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's true, born and raised. How did your faith play into how you went about writing and approaching this book? I guess it makes me open-minded and curious about religion in a way that not everybody is. You know, I'm willing to, I, I love the fascinating little bits about Hindu heaven or, uh, or Muslim hell or whatever, because they remind me about the little details and folklore in my own Sunday school uh, lessons back in the day. I, I just find you personally fascinating because I'm the person watching Jeopardy at home that gets like three right, and I'm <laughs> thrilled at that. And we were saying how you were doing that and just getting them all right. How has this gone from being the ordinary guy sitting on the couch answering all the Jeopardy questions correctly to the winningest Jeopardy contestant ever to now host of host. Jeopardy? I can't believe it. It feels like it must be a prank, and at some point they're going to reveal what's been going on. I, it was always my favorite show as a kid. It was, it felt like a safe space to be smart. You know, on Jeopardy, people were celebrated for knowing things, which didn't always seem to be true in real life America, and and that meant a lot to me. And the fact that I can now still go to work there, I feel. I feel so lucky. I feel like the little kid that won the chocolate factory. Now, my one game show that I've always been pretty good at, an RSTLNE, that you know, before yes. they even gave you, I would I would always pick those and, and kind of be able to, in my mind, decide that I was able to get solve the answer. We just recently heard that Pat Sajak is going to retire. Did you grow up watching? I mean, it feels like the end of an era. It really does. For Pat and Alex to be gone within just a few years, I mean, that was America's evening for almost 40 years. And as we saw in Jeopardy, it's very difficult to navigate that transition, right. you know, because people are used to those hosts and they feel like they were 
guests in their homes for, for those decades. You learned anything from Pat Sajak? Yeah, absolutely. Watching him, even watching him as a kid, you know, he was very different than Alex. Alex was beautiful at keeping the game running seriously and smoothly, but Pat always had a little joke, you know? Pat was obviously a quick thinker, and that's not always right for Jeopardy, but I have Pat in the back of my mind sometimes when I, when I see a chance to, to make a little joke. Well, Jeopardy host Ken Jennings, we thank you so much, and we want to let our viewers know that his book, 100 Places to See After You Die, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, we bring you the sweet story of a community center that rallied behind a Marine and left him feeling on cloud nine. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, wake up with Selma Hayek. Good morning, America. And this week, Garth Brooks has something new to announce, and he's doing it on GMA. Plus, a super summer deals and steals. That is great. All on Good Morning America. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Finally tonight, a wish granted. 80-year-old John Brees spent most of his adult life flying planes. He recently got the chance to get back into the cockpit and in flight again thanks to the Tree of Dreams at a retirement community in Omaha, Nebraska. Reporter Cal Larson from our partner station KETV has his story. Anytime you get near an airplane, I'm always excited. I never have been not excited around airplanes. John Brees has piloted more flights than he can count. I would have always flown. You know, I, I, well, I wanted to fly all my life. From being a lamplighter pilot in the Marines to giving lessons for the extension service, Tuesday morning, Brees was a pilot yet again. He described the feeling pre-flight. Something comes over you and it just takes any stress or whatever, it just drains it away. And that's the feeling. And I can't really, I don't have the words to describe it if I, ever, I wish I had the words. Brees was able to get in this plane thanks to a program at Crown Point Retirement Community called Tree of Dreams. Elizabeth Wells helps run the program. He wanted to get up in the air one more time, and so we are going to do that for him today. Sending Brees up in flight is the first wish Crown Point has granted. This means a ton to him because he wants to feel like he is back in his glory days. As the plane touched down and taxied back to its spot, Bree stepped off the plane and cracked a joke when asked if he'd go back up anytime soon. Yeah, I'll go right now. In fact, I was going to run inside and see what Bob's got an inventory in there. <laughs> <laughs> Except everyone knows he wasn't joking. Oh, so happy to see him back in the air again. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody save me. I love you. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, former President Trump pleads not guilty to federal criminal charges, the 37 counts against...